Hey everyone, welcome to this week's episode of Fight Chat Friday from TKD Coach Academy. This is episode 149, uh, getting very close to that three-year mark, Richie, of consistent uh, videos out there. And yep. uh, yeah, it's kind of getting exciting, I think. Yeah, definitely. So we've gone through nearly every topic under the sun of ITF sparring at this stage. So uh, as you can imagine, it's kind of getting a bit difficult to come up with some new topics. Some of them <laughs> are going over again and coming up with new yeah. realizations as we kind of delve into more different areas, such as the the stats that we've been doing there now recently as well, which throws up its own kind of um, takeaways and different points to riff on. So uh, that's going to be interesting as well. And we have some stats lined up for this fight today as well. Yeah, and of course, as uh, as competitions come along, we get more live streaming, there's more to see and uh, more to comment on. And with that in mind today, we're going back to the European Cup that took place in Lublin, in Poland. And uh, we weren't either of us there ourselves in person. So this is looking at matches in retrospect and trying to pick out likely matches that could be interesting. And for today, we've picked uh, two competitors. Uh, one, I have... Uh, uh, never actually uh, come across before uh, in terms of uh, seeing an international competition. So Philippa Kanka from Sweden. Uh, and again, it's in the final against uh, Zuzana Gajawa from Poland, who we do know and has been quite successful uh, in the uh, in various divisions like minus 75 and you know it, it, depending on where where it's fallen in the the women's divisions and i suppose now will be uh might this might well sit uh, as we're heading into the world championships in plus division could be minus 75 plus 75 i'm not, I'm not entirely sure where, where this lies now so mm -hmm. with the changes but made for an interesting match to watch again simply because it's kind of the way i'd look at this is it's kind of off season you know so it's for uh for poland i think it came pretty soon after their national championships so you'd expect that the, a lot of the polish competitors would be carrying their end of season form straight through for others it could be four six weeks after european championships uh training has finished and you're trying to ramp back up again so yeah it was kind of an interesting placing for the tournament to be in and uh yeah so this two new competitors for us to cover i don't think we've had either of the, these ladies on the channel before so let's jump in have a little look at the match and see what comes up all right, so straight off the bat, as you can see from the bottom, we have Philippa in red from Sweden and Susanna in blue from Poland. Yeah, and straight away we see Susanna taking more of a uh, a pulling kind of approach to this. So she's drawing back, she's pulling, circling to her back and pulling Philippa towards her and uh, leaving out the, the threat of that front leg. But it's quite passive, you know. We're seeing, uh, you know, no, no, no. I'll just give up my space. Uh, you can come and get me if you want, but I'm, I, I'm quite happy to give up the space. And it's kind of really challenging Philippa to do something proactive and aggressive. And as soon as she's kind of dropped a little bit heavy, or in this case, even uh, it's just been leg over the top, we see a very, very nice hacks or hook kick from uh, Susanna and a very, very clear uh, headshot. Yeah, I think um, Philippa's bouncing on her footwork. Let's say. And her rhythm is very distinctive and i don't notice that give a, a, a real tell when she does attack which makes it a little bit easier especially for Susanna being the taller fighter and quite leggy to be mm. able to have that extra distance that she has to then come into and we've seen that so far in the first two major exchanges that she has to bypass that for the range and then with that little bit of a tell maybe because the bounce is a bit more distinctive even though Philippa has a good front leg of her own, um, it's 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 a hard distance to get through without getting hit, especially as leggy as Susanna is and accurate with that. Yeah, and and she's done a wonderful job of having the leg over the top and then maintaining that uh, the the chamber position so she get that head kick in, and then those principles maximize your scores, build momentum. You know, she didn't uh, just take that three pointer and run for the bank. Uh, she stayed in there with it and continued to pile on the pressure, building up scores with hands uh, and driving uh, Philippa out for an exit as well. So quite quite good principles there. Yeah, quite interesting as well the way she holds her body. Sometimes she's quite low and then sometimes she goes taller. So she, uh, Susanna tends to change that up a little bit as well, which is interesting because usually someone stays lower to the ground, they're going to be that little bit more explosive. Um, like we see here, she's a bit lower, so I think she's ready for a blitz because I, I guess that's where most people are going to try find their success against her. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and it's definitely something where we're we're going to see Philip kind of create a little bit of pressure with the hands, and you would expect that coming from the shorter fighter against the taller fighter, you'd expect her to have to transition and try hands. 
as you said earlier she does have a decent front leg herself so yeah why not you could clash into it and uh, stop Susanna from maybe dominating with the front leg but that just wasn't the game that was played it was uh, very much a case of Susanna pulling about the ring letting Philippa walk into her range and taking the front leg as a defensive shot primarily yeah see of course after that, that first big headshot there in round one as well Philip is going to have that in the back of her mind that she's not going to be throwing caution to the wind too easily either because she knows that she got kicked in the head pretty hard there early on in round one so it takes a bit of guts to get in there and to get stuck into that as well yeah but this was good again we, we get a nice position where she can actually bring in that uh, back leg turning kick nice. potentially a separating score something to get an extra a uh, couple of points on the exchange and you know a, a good example of getting to hands here also uh you know i think she split as uh, zana stance really quite well so zana ends up with the uh, left leg outside and she's trying to get her weight forward again does a really good job of it but it means that philippa has that advantage for a time yeah and i think that the as you say here bizarre warning not too sure why but we understand here now that in itf sparring it's so important to get your game plan to the forefront asap if something's not working you got to switch it i know she's fine that she has a bit of a route to success with hands but she's got to be careful bypassing that range as well because Susanna is very very dangerous that front leg able to pull it up from crazy angles and just come over the top no bother at all get that headshot three points yeah that leg control i mean you, you take that almost like from your traditional more technical elements of sparring you know your leg control leg strength and you can see there the trans, uh, how it translates into the sparring the ability to keep the leg up and go from those stopping positions and unfortunately i think uh, philip has kind of lost the head a little bit and uh you know it has started chasing and the decisions aren't as uh they're not as calculated and she's ended up getting a, a few um would say it's just adding to the score it, it's not it's not affecting the overall outcome it's just letting uh Susanna build up the points a little bit in the last 10 or 15 seconds there yeah so let's look at this as a standard kicker versus puncher battle yeah what would you like to see a little bit more from Philip Adair to, to get the better return with the hands as you said the rhythm with the bounce seems to be a little bit predictable and we're seeing a step in with the front or when she's intending to use the front leg and i think she starts a little bit far away typically when she's starting with hands so we'd like to see a little bit of push from her to see if we can shorten the distance or disguise her step so that she can get into that distance a little bit closer see if Susanna lifts uh because generally there's plenty of space behind philippa the whole time Susanna has conceded the center of the ring no interest in fighting for it so in that case you should be able to push in and come right back out as needed, you know, if the leg lifts and drops. And, you know, from, from that point of view, taking a little bit of control, she already has the central position, a little bit contr of control over the distance between herself and Susanna, uh, and a little bit of testing to make the front leg a little bit more nervous or edgy so that she can push through. But I do think it's the hands finishing with that dolio that was her most successful uh, shot, her combination of shots, and I think... Going back to the well with that, with a little bit of additional preparation, would be a good place to start for her. Yeah, I think it's that. That's it exactly. But she, she needs to make sure that Susanna drops that front leg first, because when she still has it up, even though she's already after kicking, let's say, if it's still up, there's that big thread of a headshot as well, which we've seen three or four times in this fight. Yeah. And even though we didn't see many warnings, I think there was two on each side. That's all. There was an opportunity for her to maybe squeeze the space a bit more because Susanna was willing to concede, as we've seen. But when you kick someone in the head three or four times, clearly, you know, you can concede yeah. that a little bit. It's never going to claw it back. But I think against um, somebody to her own level, that's kind of going to be a bit more uh, poignant with somebody who can clash the legs a bit better. Use that to push them back. Mm. Gain up the warnings on your side as well while getting the hands. I think that's going to be the, the way you can do it as well. If we flip it on its head, then as a kicker, someone like Susanna, what's your... Um, tactics there or strategy as the coach of that person to be able to be very dominant obviously she was quite dominant winning four nil and scoring many headshots so she did yeah. very well but anything extra you'd like to see her do yeah i mean just to, to go with her like she's been all pull and not so much push so i think if she had just the the, the every now and again pushed in at hip level maybe with the kick or almost intentionally dropped the kick long to invite uh philippa to hands it would have brought in that defensive kick again really really easily um you know i think just that there is no need for her to be as rooted to the edge of the ring as she was i think she could have uh you know potentially fought the exact same game by just having uh, you know the occasional push back into the middle of the ring um that said 
you know, once she actually got that initial headshot, all the incentive was out with Philippa to come forward. So she didn't have to, she could, uh, you know, she didn't have to push into center. She could focus on pulling Philippa again onto that range and force her to come through the uh, the leg. Um, I think this is just one where, particularly if we're looking at the guys uh, and, and the male side of sparring, we'd expect that you would need to reclaim your space in the center a little bit more often, you know, to give you room to pull off and circle again. Otherwise, you're probably conceding a lot more warnings. Yeah, and just for some people that may not be familiar with the terms, myself and Adrian use, when we say pull, it's essentially you backing up and allowing them to come into the space. Usually to set up a trap, ideally, or to go forward yourself again mm. and flip flip that on its head then for pushing. So you want you want to be push and pull, ideally moving in and out. You never want to be bouncing up and down. You want to be either going in or out, depending on what you want to do. And the best fighters tend to go in and out at the same time in terms of their rhythm so they're never really backing up backing up backing up backing up and they, they change that interchangeably to keep their opponent on um on tabs i guess and making sure that they're yeah alert um so yeah i think you're you're spot on there definitely with the, the leg your fighter you need to be able to switch it up as well just in case someone is able to clash with you who's taller and has that range i think if philip was that little bit taller it might have been a bit of a different story there as well so backing up so much and letting people get the hands not ideal so you need to keep that position long and in your favor and then be thinking of the follow-on scores as well but yeah um some good takeaways there for people to put into their game whether you're mm. more of a, a puncher or more of a kicker i'm sure there's learning there for you whether it's for you or on the flip side to be able to beat people who have the opposite style so there we go hopefully you got some bit from that yeah just the, the last little bit to have a look at as a big contrast from last week where we looked at the uh Barada camp both thomas himself from uh, 2003 and uh, ziga from uh, 2023 and we look at the work rate you know we're talking about you know a much lower output in terms of number of shots thrown um but you know uh, what what is clear here is that there's more attempt to make contact each time uh the carry isn't being used as much to try and just create or dictate space and uh we can see uh, a, a fairly high return especially from Susanna on a relatively no, low number of shots i mean it's very obvious with the with the hacks uh and the side kick in particular you know six side kicks thrown five landed uh you know that's that's quite <laughs> quite good return on your investment work rate wise yeah, it's very impressive, really, because nobody's able to do that. I always say you're looking to throw maybe between eight and ten to land one good, clear one. So yeah. to be able to rack up that um, ratio of efficiency there is very impressive. But I think the the big telling point from the last couple of fights is the overall volume. You can see the the graph there at the bottom only goes as far as ten. Yeah. So we can see the overall volume from both fighters a little bit lower, and I think that's fair to say that the higher weights you go, especially in the female, yes, a little definitely. bit less of uh, overall volume. That's just normal as well as just efficiency of you know smaller people are a little bit faster as well. We see if fifty-seven men, for example, sixty trees last week. Usually their volume is pretty high, and last yeah. week the sixty trees was as high as we've seen so far. So that kind of stays true to what you expect. And it just means that if you're watching this and you're thinking, hey, I, I'm not sure I achieve that kind of work rate, something to consider is the weight class that you're fighting in uh, and whether or not that, you know, that work rate is appropriate to your weight class. It probably does fall off a little bit, uh, you know, as you go towards the heavier weights, as you've said, Richie, and maybe even a little bit different in terms of work rate on the female side too. Yeah, definitely. So there we go, guys. Hope you enjoyed that and took some bits away for your own sparring game. And we shall see you in the next one. Any ideas, send them our way. Excellent. Best of luck. See you next Friday. See you next one.